and that maybe will help those of us, I include myself in this, who tend to be a conflict averse, to actually not maybe look for it, but not be afraid of it when it comes to us. Because there might be something we can learn here. We might be able to become more skilled. And the only way that we can become more skilled is not by reading it in a book, but by having, by actually going through the conflict. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the show, Judy. Well, hello, AJ. Hello, Johnny. And thank you for welcoming me. It's great to be here. And of course, the theme of this month is conflict resolution. We yeah. were talking a little bit before the show uh, how we ended up on this. And last year, we released an episode on conflict resolution, really looking at conflict in our personal relationships, family and friends, and how to deal with that. It's a question that comes up a lot for us in our courses. And that episode was wildly successful so Johnny and I thought all right let's bring in the experts and let's go even deeper on conflict resolution and we really enjoyed your book and and your expertise on conflict so we'd love to dig in a little bit more today I'd love to know how did you get started focusing on conflict resolution because it, it doesn't seem like very many people are even focused on it no it's true and uh I'm not surprised that your podcast was wildly successful <laughs> because everyone wants to know how to do it. And it's harder and harder, I think, because uh, the way that uh, conflict is usually seen, uh, you know, on, on our screens now is not very <laughs> a good event. Right. So I got started in a personal way because I wasn't very good at it either. Uh, this is a long, long time ago. But I mean, I grew up in a Midwestern family where dad was right, mom helped. You know, and, you know, it was my way or the highway with my family. You know, the kids just did what they were told. So I learned really early on how to accommodate very well. And I'm still really good at it, by the way. So I call myself an approval-seeking missile. So if, if, if you want anything from me, I'll say yes, so just ask. On the other hand, right, so somewhere maybe in my, you know, late 30s, 40s, I'm in the workplace, and I'm finding out – so. The career I'm in now, which is teaching conflict and communication skills, is about a 25-year career. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you how that got started, but uh, I also had a 13-year career selling real estate and owning a couple of real estate companies. I'm a, an entrepreneur at heart. And in the real estate business, you're faced with conflict all the time. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, you're in the middle of, of a conflict, or you're in conflict with someone like a building inspector, another realtor, a banker, somebody doesn't want to do what you want them to do. And I found that I was going home and always like feeling like no one listened to me and everyone was getting their way but me. And so I started looking at some of the reasons for that. Uh, and around the same time, I was faced with a new manager who uh, was sort of squashing my style. Um, I was making a lot of money for the company. I didn't own my own company at the time. And um, I felt like, you know, I, I was going to leave. But the head of the company didn't want me to leave, so they sent me to a course. And meanwhile, I, I really wanted to learn about conflict, as I said, because I had this one style, and it didn't fit all. So I went to the course. I began to learn how to be more assertive. And I have skills now so that I can say no. I can express a difference of opinion. I can ask for what I want. It's not my first choice. And this is important to know because I'll always be an accommodator. And I don't mind that about myself. I think it's nice sometimes. You know, the accommodator in the room, mm -hmm. everyone loves them, right? And yet, uh, it's not always great for teams either because uh, the team needs to know where you stand if they're going to solve a problem, if they're going to have an elegant solution. So, shall I go on? Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I went to this course, and I met a man named Thomas Crum, who became my mentor in this work. And I began to learn about the uh, martial art Aikido, mm -hmm. and the metaphor of Aikido at first, and I became fascinated with it. So I would go every year to go back and study with Tom. He's still a good friend and a mentor and a man who definitely walks his talk, and he's very generous, always has been. So he began to teach me his skills, and I went to all his workshops and gradually got certified in the approach and came back, and this was about the time, early 90s, that I was leaving the real estate world and looking for what I was going to do next. 
uh, I wanted to wake up in the morning going, wow, I really am excited about what I'm doing now. I'm going to go to, you know, this isn't work anymore, it's play. And I tried a lot of different things. And since I was certified now by Tom in this IKEA approach, I decided to try that out as one of my, right, uh, options. And I loved it, of course. And all my friends, I only had friends I could invite at that time, you know, public workshops. And uh, my friends loved it. And they said, and then pretty soon their friends were calling me up and say, when are you going to do this again? You know, this sounds really fun. So I started uh, offering them just publicly. Uh, very organic beginning to my work and uh, people started coming and gradually people came and said oh wow would you do this in my school or would you do this at my office and so that's how my company grew and that's how I grew in the skills and I need to say too at this point that because I just was familiar with the metaphor and not the art itself I began to study Aikido and that was also about 25 years ago and I gradually started my own because I'm an entrepreneur, my own dojo, <laughs> which means place of practice. And uh, so now there's a Portsmouth Aikido that is now run by one of my original students who started in high school and now owns, the, owns that business. So uh, it's just been such a joy. Um, I know you'll ask me more questions and we'll talk more about Aikido, but it's just an amazing art and an amazing metaphor for how we can deal with conflict in a more uh, elegant, graceful, and solution-oriented, partnering way. Right. Do you remember what it was about Akita that piqued your interest, the, the, the first thing that sort of grabbed you? Uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> it's because, so one of the first things I grabbed down to in Aikido is that uh, instead of resisting the attack, mm -hmm. so I know your listeners can't see this, but I'm sort of blocking and punching back, right? Instead of doing that, you enter. You, you get out of the way of the attack. So if a punch is coming your way, you kind of turn sideways. That's all you have to do. Mm -hmm. and suddenly you're out of the way. You move in, and now you're in a position to blend with the attack energy, to in fact connect with it physically and redirect it. And so because I'm an accommodator, right? <laughs> I loved that, yeah. right? <laughs> I loved that. And it took me a while to see the power, to really understand the redirection and where the power of Aikido was. And I'm sure you, you've seen this in other areas as well but so many people who are involved in martial arts has seen that as building blocks for conflict we have people like uh joe rogan is always talking yes. about it when it comes yeah. to uh, Brazil, uh bjj uh so as um jocko willink yes. who of course uses that martial arts approach as well do you th do you is there anything there that you can pull out that that has a universal flare with it sure in fact in my workshops uh, and in my coaching i often ask people uh, if, if they practice any martial art mm -hmm. at all and what they have taken away from it because most of the time these are adults and they, they're often not practicing now they practiced as kids or as teenagers and they're always saying things like um well a sense of presence or i know how to collect myself when i need to Mm -hmm. I have a sense of uh, heightened awareness about my surroundings. Um, I know discipline. You know, discipline is, is a big one that people take. Certainly. Away. Yeah. All things that are important in conflict. Yes. <laughs> yes. And in life, right? Yeah. I mean, when we think about that metaphor, it really is beautiful for conflict as well, because I think a lot of us, we try to blunt the force coming at us. Yeah. And of course, that leads to more conflict. It doesn't actually get it resolved. So to be able to move out of it, change directions, and now be both working together towards a resolution, it, it really is a beautiful metaphor for how we should all go about conflict. Yes, it's a beautiful metaphor, and we all want to do it. I think we all want to do it when we hear about it. Oh, that makes so much sense, right? To show right. me how, mm -hmm. right? And yet, what gets in the way? So that's what's interesting to me. Why don't we do it, right? You want to know? Well, I, I think I know, but yeah. <laughs> no, what would you say? What did you I mean, say? ego, yeah. I would assume. Yeah, that's a big one. That's a big one. And it's because we have been trained to be right. Mm -hmm. And also our brains are releasing chemicals when we're right. When we, when we get that, we get this like, uh, I forget which chemical it is um, because I'm not a brain scientist, but um, Judith Glazer's written about this. And uh, the chemicals that are released in your brain feel really good when you end up being right and people praise you for that. On the other hand, there are also chemicals that get, that get released 
when you form a connection with someone. And so when you say, I don't know, or can you tell me more, or you start to get curious and you learn, there's also other, con- so there, it goes both ways. But right. oftentimes we need to be right because of those ego hormones that, <laughs> that are running rampant. Yeah, and, and we were talking about this earlier, our childhood, right? A sense of shame yes. and embarrassment often accompanies parenting. So when we think about taking responsibility for something, well, that's shameful. I'm going to lose face. I'm going to be viewed negatively by my teammates. And unfortunately, we, we put all of those in front of the resolution. Yes. <laughs> it's the resolution that matters the most. Yes. Because the longer conflict um, is there, the longer conflict is present, resentment forms, toxic environment is formed. And I know we were laughing earlier. I, growing up, I was very conflict averse. My dad, same way, my way or the highway. So I knew not to get in conflict with dad. Mm-hmm. So because of that, you know, I would ignore conflict. Mm-hmm. I would sweep it under the rug. Oh, it's fine. And guess what? If someone is in conflict with you and there's not a resolution, it doesn't get better on its own. <laughs> it doesn't right. work that way, especially in a team environment. Now, what we loved a uh, study that you talked about in the book in 2008, yeah. uh, just around how much conflict we will encounter in the workplace. Can you unpack that study for us? And then we'd love to know, do you think it's gotten worse? I, I do. And, you know, I, I keep I kept looking for studies that were more recent. But that one was uh, billions of dollars in wasted productivity because of, of conflict in the workplace. And how many managers, that was interesting research too, aren't trained. They become managers for reasons that have nothing to do with their ability to actually manage conflict and manage people sometimes. Yeah. So yeah, the research is compelling. Um, I, I want to skip back for just one second about another reason that we don't um, that we don't blend with with it, and that we don't get curious, that we pr- uh, prefer to be right. And some of that also has to do with the way that we're trained, as you were saying. Uh, we watch our parents, and m- my dad was the same way, and I didn't want to be like that, right? And so we, we said, well, I'm not going to be like that, so I'll, I'll be the opposite of that. And what I've learned through my studies in conflict and my experience in practicing my own teaching is that it doesn't have to be either or, and that whenever we get into an either or uh, belief system, like I either have to, it's either my way or the highway or whatever, right? Or I just give up and go limp. Um, it's not, it, it can be both powerful and kind. We can be assertive. That's what assertiveness is, really. It's it's being powerful and kind at the same time. It's like, you know, thanks very much for uh, that um, that offer, AJ. But I prefer to go somewhere else right now. Is that would that work for you? And if it doesn't, you know, the other person can say. I think one of the reasons it's hard to be assertive, as I've you know learned in my own practice, because I'm it's not my natural uh, proclivity, is that um, I think it's hard because we're afraid the other person might say no. And it's okay if they say no. Once I give that other person the right to say no, I can ask for anything I want, right? Because mm-hmm. they have a right too. But I don't know, maybe it's because of my upbringing and I didn't feel like I could say no, that I, I worry about them feeling like they could say no, right? Yeah, it gets imprinted on you. It does. It's, well, yeah. uh, this is something we were speaking about earlier of just how you're raised, it, has, it carries ramifications in your adult life. Yes. And certainly with my sister and I growing up, um, it was, we was always trying to dump the responsibility or whose fault it was on each other so that the other one would get yelled at and (laughs) we could hot potato. No one was. Yeah. (laughs) And then there comes a, and I remember that there was a point when I was uh, in my teens where my dad now wanted me to present things. So there was teachable moments that we could discuss them. But even at those moments, going up to him for the first time to, to, to bring this problem and terrified because he said, well, if you bring it to me and you're honest about it, you won't get in trouble. It's like, well, any time that I've ever done anything in the past, I've gotten in trouble. And now you want me to flip this around. And that is a very difficult thing because those teaching moments as a teenager certainly are far and few between from all the times in as a child that you had gotten yelled at for doing dumb things. And so there certainly needs to be a a, a more balanced uh, between the the two of them to to come out on the other side a little bit more open to the to these ideas. Well, one thing that that we get a lot of emails about is parents. Uh 
and you know understanding how to manage conflict with kids mm -hmm. and, and you know we have come out the other side knowing that well maybe our families didn't manage conflict <laughs> in a very reasonable <laughs> manner mm -hmm. but getting these skills at a parent level to be able to imprint that on your child that no it's not just about who's right or wrong we can work together to solve this and make sure it doesn't happen again you know I think that's a missing component. We talk about, oh, managers don't have it. Well, it starts as kids, how you're managing conflict with your siblings, if you have them, or the kids at school, how your parents are managing conflict in the relationship, and then we carry that on. And we'll talk about this in a second, this idea of skilled incompetence. Yes, and, so true. And how detrimental it is as people rise in their career. So what do you mean by skilled incompetence and the ladder of inference? Yeah, yeah, wow. Two important concepts. Well, skilled incompetence, it, for me, it has to do with habits. That, in fact, we become very skilled at certain habits that aren't helpful and that make us incompetent at conflict. Uh, and when you mentioned one of the habits already, I, I need to be right. And some people get so needy about that that it doesn't matter if it's their child or their parent or their best friend. Mm -hmm or they're the manager at work uh, and it's their employee and they'll win at all costs. And it's just something that they've learned how to do somewhere from their parent or their teacher or watching the world go by. You know, there's a lot of people who are teaching us that habit. And uh, all we have to do to break it is to form a new one. Mm -hmm. And we have to want to, okay? So that, I mean, really it all comes down to us in my, um, in my work and in my books, I talk a lot about uh, it starts here, and I know you do too, with all of your teaching, that I don't have any power to change you. I only have power to change me. And I forget it all the time, okay, even after all this, these years of teaching it. And, I, and when I teach it, everyone says, oh, of course I know that. But it's just, it's a habit that I want you to change because you could make my life so perfect if you would be just this way. And uh, so anyway, that's one habit, all right? I need to be right. Another habit is maybe that I am uh, very skilled at avoiding, at being conflict averse. And I don't want to try anything else because it might, you know, I might get in trouble if I bring something up. I've seen it happen to other people, so I'm not going to do it. So we have to just, if, again, what's in it for you? You know, if you want to have better relationships, if you want to be more socially skilled, then all you have to do, and honestly, it is this simple, is to form, an, is to practice a new habit until it becomes as rote as, and unconscious as the old one was. Because the current one's unconscious, so we don't even think of it as a habit. And it is. It's definitely a habit. Now, the ladder of inference is another habit, right, that we have of jumping up. So the, the ladder of inference is just, if you can envision a ladder, you know, draw a ladder on a piece of paper. At the bottom of that ladder is the data, okay? We're sitting here at a table. I have two mugs, three mugs of, that say the art of charm on it. We've got some uh, iPads. We're sitting three people and there's someone else watching us, right? Uh, and helping us make this happen. So that's just some data, right? But I've already selected the data that I'm looking at. I haven't even mentioned that there's this incredible mm -hmm. view outside this window, right, that I could look at at any time and get my sort of my uh, perspective back if I decide to, uh, that, I, that there are lights, that there's another office outside. So there's all kinds of data. But when we walk into a room, and especially if we're in a conflict, and we see the person that we don't like in that conflict, we don't see anything else but that person. We miss a whole bunch of data. So we've already selected. Now, what am I going to do with that data? I'm going to start to interpret it. So you see each rung of the ladder, I get a little higher and a little farther away from the actual data, the actual facts that are happening in the room. So when I finally get to the top of the ladder, usually there's a conclusion. Maybe I've made an interpretation that this person has a sour face. You know, maybe they're, maybe they're just busy at work and, mm -hmm. and they're, they're focused and they're concentrated. But because I've had some other interactions with them, it's really easy for me to, to make an interpretation that they're upset. And so then I wonder what they're upset about. Maybe they're upset about me. Maybe it's something I did. Maybe it's what I said at the meeting. Well, I'm not going to say anything to them because they're obviously upset with me. And so I've begun to form a story, <laughs> a narrative, that uh, 
this person doesn't like me and they're upset with me and so I stop talking to them and then what happens they stop talking to me because they think I'm upset well of course I am but you see this thing just builds and builds yeah and do you think it has a ratchet effect where one, once it's going in one direction it's very difficult to, to go backwards uh, yes and uh, it's only difficult if we don't have an awareness about it right and if we don't take charge of ourselves first. So any time in that narrative, in that ladder of inference story I just gave you, uh, anywhere in there I could go, and I do now, of course, because I know about it. It happens with my husband all the time, right? And, and we have a language now that we can use with each other. He'll say, Judy, I think you're way up the ladder. <laughs> and I'll go, yeah, you're right, you know? Okay, yeah. let me come back down, tell me what actually happened. Or sometimes he'll catch me doing with people outside of our household, you know, and, and I'll say, I think that you know, Kristen said something today. I think she was really upset with me. I should have spoken to her. He said, are, are you climbing up the ladder? You know, what happened? And so then I come back down. And, and the one thing you pointed yeah. out there, and I, I think this is one of the most important rungs of that ladder of inference, is we then start to personalize everything. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, you know, okay, I avoided looking at the sunset out here and I avoided some data. But as you move up the ladder, now you're personalizing it. You're yes. saying that sour look is because of me and something I did. I did. And what we talk about in raising the self-awareness is to just note the trigger, right? You start to make that judgment and then to ask yourself, is there another possible reason that AJ is frowning? Is there, could there yes. be something else that happened yes. that would cause this? And the more you start to ask that question, you start to, okay, take a step back, see more of the data and go, well, yeah, Judy had a long ride up here to the studio. Maybe she was a little frustrated in traffic. It has nothing to do with the email I sent three weeks ago. Why am I personalizing it, right? <laughs> so these are all these moments that are happening habitually. Yes. We've picked them up yes. through time. Not good tools to bring to the table when it comes to conflict. No. Um, yeah, and we fill in those gaps. Um, and, yeah. you know, it's it's difficult because once again we're looking at if you're conflict adverse the stories that you're going to tell yourself could be so wild and 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 and, and, and to the regular person hearing this narrative where they're sort of like that is actually kind of crazy mm -hmm. but yet it's very rational to you because you've put it all together yes and with that ladder of inference what what ends up happening as you climb the ladder is you stop listening mm-hmm because you feel like you've taken in enough data, you've reached your conclusion, I've inferred everything I need to know about this situation, so you can block out the sunset, so to speak. And that's really one of the first tools you talk about with conflict resolution, is we have to come in listening. Yes. If we're not listening, the conflict is not gonna be solved. That's right. And AJ, something else about what you said, which is that not only are we not listening, but we're actually looking for data that reinforces Our own right, the story yeah. we, and the conclusion we've created about this person. Right? I'm, so there was a, I'm gonna come back in a minute to listening, uh, but there was a, um, I just finished teaching a workshop here in, in Long Beach, and, um, and it was interesting because there were a lot of wonderful people there. And it's easy in any workshop to, to sort of pick out people that are more friendly than others. And there, there was one person who was just a little less friendly than some, you know. And, and uh, I, I tried to make a connection. I, I went up, you know, and, and we talked. And, but it, it just w went nowhere, right? And it was like uh, that person was too busy for me. And so I, I thought, huh, I wonder what's going on, you know. I wonder if it's something I said, right? So I'm already up the ladder. I wonder if they're not enjoying the program, all climbing higher and higher. And I thought, I thought to myself, I bet it has nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. I bet maybe, and who knows, it could be something like maybe she met, that person met somebody that looked like me that they don't like. You know, who knows? I mean, it could be anything. But back to your point, when we personalize stuff, it, it, um, it takes our power away. It wastes energy. We spend so much time in our heads thinking about why they're upset, what I did, when it probably has nothing to do with me and I am not the most important person in the world. And when we start to make up other stories and that's mm -hmm. all it takes, we catch ourselves, we come back, we go, hmm, I wonder what, maybe they're just busy, like you said. Uh, maybe 
uh, they're just frustrated because of the traffic, whatever it is. When we do that, we relieve a lot of stress. We take stress off ourselves, we stop wasting energy, and we begin to focus on what's really important, which is possibly finding out more about the person, if that's what we want to do, right? If we want to forge the relationship, if we want to build the relationship, then we might say, hey, is everything okay? What's going on? Uh, and, I, you know, I, I went into that little piece because we have to know what's in it for us to change our habits. Otherwise, we just won't do it. Why would I want to make up another story? This one works really well. Mm -hmm. I like thinking she's mad at me. Well, right? to, to go along with that as well, if that is your go-to, to personalize it and make it, oh, this person must be mad at me, well, that's all, that's where you're going to go all the time. Yes. And before you know it, the whole world is out to get you. And, and, and wow. that is, you put that together. And, I, and when that occurs, <laughs> you've exactly that given up your power because now all you're doing is che chasing other people's approval and acceptance. Yes. And it's not a healthy place to be. No. Certainly not at a, a conflict level, especially. Right. And I think what, what's so interesting about this is, you know, we talk about these cognitive distortions on the, the show all the time that when you get interested in this stuff and you start realizing that this brain that we have, is not interpreting the truth it is bringing its own perception and mm -hmm. creating this reality and and inferring a lot of things that aren't there you start to realize that there are these fallacies we fall into and these patterns are not just in conflict they end up as johnny was saying showing up in all parts of our relationship mm -hmm. and it turns off our ability to listen yes. it turns off our ability to be present and we talk about this that stress that physiological response creates the fight or flight Yes. And that does not help you think clearly and get to a resolution. Yes, yes. So we've identified the triggers. We've identified some things that we're doing uh, habitually even that can yes. hinder us. Yes. So how can we bring listening to the forefront and be better listeners to start in conflict? Yeah. Well, uh, it's pretty easy, actually, <laughs> if you want to do it. And it starts for me with curiosity. I really want to know. I have to really be curious. Uh, and it's funny because we can ask questions all day long, but we don't really want to know. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, uh, an example is uh, I was working with a, a woman at a fairly high level in a Fortune 500 company one time. And she was so upset by her uh, coworker who was always copying everyone on emails and sometimes made the department look bad. And so, uh, you know, I can't blame her. And so, she, you know, she was really upset. And I said, well, let's talk about this. What question would you ask? Let's see what's going on. Why would this person do this? What do you think? You know, let's be curious about it. Let's, let's try to posit some different scenarios. And if you could ask the, your manager, what would, or your coworker, excuse me, what would you say? I'd say, why are you sending all those emails? You know, why are you copying everybody in all those emails? I said, that's a good question. Okay. Uh, can we try it, asking it in a way that is actually more curious? Did you see how you asked that, right? So it's not what she said, it's how she said it. And she said, okay, let me try it. Okay. How, how is it that you're sending, uh, all, uh, copying everyone on, on all the emails? I'm curious why you're doing that, right? And she had a really different affect to her tone. I said, wow, that sounded really interesting. She might want to actually answer that question. Uh, what did you have to do? What, 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 how did you change yourself? She said, well, I actually had to be curious. I actually had to be curious. And for me, that was a real um, eye-opener, too, because it made me realize that we're all of us often asking questions, but we don't really want to know the answer. And it's more of a, a command or an attack. Right, it's hoping for a validation of the answer we've already arrived to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, the question, right? Yes. And yes. well, if it's not, a lot of times your answer is completely ignored because it doesn't fit the narrative that they had put together. And th this is where empathy comes in. And we, we've dove deep into empathy as well. I think for a lot of us, if we don't go in the view with this person's trying the best with whatever information or seat that they're in. Uh, we lose that ability to be curious, yes. right? Because now it becomes accusatory. Yes. And that person's going to feel attacked. Yes. And I notice the difference in your tone and obviously in your words. And, and these both matter, right? Yes. The yes. way that you say it 
and the words that you use have a direct impact on how the other person's going to feel in that moment. Yes, and, and I will include some tips here. Uh, for example, the second time I said it, I said how or what. what what makes you want to send or copy all those people on, on emails? Instead of why are you copying everybody mm-hmm. on those emails, right? So to, to uh, encourage a more honest answer or open answer, it helps to ask an open question. And oftentimes they start with how or what. Uh, another t- tip is that uh, if I really want to learn where they're coming from and to really listen, then I have to drop my agenda. And that's often difficult to do because mm. sometimes we don't even know we have one. Uh, going into a difficult conversation, for example, it really helps if you have the ability to plan for it and it just doesn't happen to you. It helps to know what's my purpose here? Why am I going into this conversation? If it's to prove someone wrong, if it's to get your way, if it's it's to change somebody else's behavior, that's not a useful purpose. You might as well just drop it and forget about it and not have the conversation at all. If it's to learn where the other person's coming from, then that's a useful uh, purpose because you can actually possibly do that if they're willing to share it with you. The other tip that I offer oftentimes is that <laughs> it's kind of, it might sound funny, but it helps me. This person, imagine this person lives on a different planet from you and E.T. suddenly dropped into <laughs> your world. You know, wouldn't you want to go, wow, what are things like up there? Tell me, what does it look like to you? Uh, and that helps me a whole lot. So in a real life situation, um, my husband and I might have an argument and I know I'm right, and I might be right, and it doesn't matter, that's the thing, it doesn't matter if you're right. Uh, What you wanna do is let that person speak and be heard, and here's the benefit to that, and this is the blending of Aikido. So remember when I said instead of blocking and punching back, I get out of the way and I enter to their side. So this is what it looks like in real life. This is me saying, uh, so tell me, how you feel about this. If you had a solution, what would it be? How do you think we should solve this problem in your view? What would be the most elegant solution to you? Or even more uh, dangerous, maybe, is uh, what did I do wrong there? How, how would I have done things differently if, um, if I could to make this, not, this argument not have happened? And it doesn't matter if they're right or not. It doesn't matter if you agree with them. You want to give them the opportunity to speak because once they've uh, done that, there's a certain uh, lightness that comes over the other person because they've had their say. And the other thing that has to happen here, and, and I make a big point of this in the book, is, I mean, it doesn't have to happen. I hate to use words like that. But it helps if you acknowledge what you hear. That's the secret, really. To be able to say, wow, it sounds like you think that um, I was upset because the computer had a technology glitch and I was just frustrated and I took it out on you. Is that what you're saying? Right? Right? And then, first of all, you learn if that's what they were saying and if you were right. And second of all, they go, yes, that's what I think happened. I said, wow, I can see how you might think that. Let's talk about it. Right? So you don't go right into, yeah, but, you know, <laughs> or no, you're wrong, okay? And, and that yes is so helpful, again, for allowing that person to feel heard yes. and for clarifying. We talked about this in our negotiation month. A mm. lot of times it's better to get more information in the situation because we now know habitually we've, we've climbed the ladder in yes. the past and we've worked with not enough information. In a conflict situation, much like a negotiation, you want as much information as possible because there are going to be resolutions that are outside of your viewpoint right now. Yeah. And if you're coming at it thinking the problem is A, and in your inference and your ability to listen, it's A, but you then go to restate it, and they go, no, actually it's B, mm. well, holy cow, all these other resolutions come to the forefront now that would have been completely blocked we let our ego get in the way. And we talked about this at the start of the show. These The two R's in conflict is responsibility and resolution. And everyone gets so hung up on responsibility. Shame, ego, everything that's Whose tied to it. Whose fault is it, right? Mm-hmm. And I noticed in your answers, your questions and the answers there that the responsibility was just shifted. It was not mm-hmm. that important. It was understanding the underlying cause of the problem and then realizing that hey, we're working together here. Mm-hmm. right? It's not a blame game. What I, I find so hilarious about this, so 
in our classes, in our programs, there on uh, Wednesday, we have a conflict resolution course uh, at the end, and we do some role playing. And before we do that, everyone has buy in that they're okay with taking responsibility in order to get to the re resolution. They see it, they understand how important it is, and they understand that that is a step that you're going to have to take in order to gain some control and move it to a resolution. What I find hilarious is the minute we start role playing, that goes right out the window because they cannot deal with taking that responsibility. And I'll be laughing and, they're, and they're, they can't figure out why they're stuck in the argument yeah. and why it's not moving to a resolution when we sat there and we broke it down. I'm like, you have ref you had not taken responsibility. And they're like, that's the second step. How is that not happening? Because it because for your whole life, you've avoided that very thing but that is the one thing that allows you to gain some control uh, over the situation and then to be able to to move it to a resolution but they will fight and and yep. and i feel so bad because i can see their head will go down and they get upset with themselves like it's so simple why am i still missing this because you have to break that habit mm -hmm. that that if that has been building for how long now? Yeah, isn't it fascinating? It's hilarious. Human beings, isn't it wonderful? I Even in a role it. play. I know it. There's no stakeholders. It's, it's a role play of going to the mechanic. You don't actually have a car in the shop. <laughs> yeah. They fall into this habit. And, 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 I, and I personally remember when I learned conflict resolution, I was so excited because at the, at the time I just sort of avoided conflict because I didn't want it to get worse. And now all of a sudden I had a roadmap and some tools. So I took it upon myself to, to find, um, to find conflict just <laughs> to see if I could talk my way out of it so I could get better and, or, uh, we don't recommend that <laughs> yeah, don't, and, or just, and, or, We're or not covering your bail or <laughs> create <laughs> conflict just to see if I could talk my way out of it. And, and this was at a, this was at a time where I was managing a bar. So there was plenty of conflict. Yeah. And I always tell the guys, I'm like, you should have some fun practicing this. With these tools, you'd be surprised just how smoothly and how fun this can be. However, what I will tell you is these rules go out the window if you're if you're trying to use them with somebody who's drunk, right? It's like, drunk, <laughs> yes. Because I was working in a bar, it's like, you don't want to play conflict resolution with a drunk person. They just don't care. Not, not a lot of awareness. No. You no. Know, what's what you remind me of are a couple of things uh johnny and one is that uh we are human beings mm -hmm. and i've been teaching this for 25 years and it often goes out the window for me too sure all right so i think that we need to be gentle on ourselves my first thought conflict. when there, there's conflict and it's not going the way i wanted it to or there's a breakdown is am i taking the responsibility here did i do that have i have i owned up to it that is my first question because as you mentioned we're human beings i've been programmed we've been programmed yes. and that is my first go-to if if there's some sort of bugged down there yes yes and the second thing that it reminded me of the idea of responsibility uh so in the book difficult conversations by uh, doug stone sheila heen and bruce Patton, um great book they talk about contribution versus blame right mm -hmm. so we're so quick to blame the other person and as you said, that takes all our power away. The minute we can look at the conflict from a point of view as who's who's contributed what, right? It may look like they've con they've done all the contribution because I'm I'm I didn't say a thing, right? I just I'm just sitting back and they're attacking me, right? But I also didn't contribute. You know, my contribution is that I didn't say a thing. Right? I right. did. I am conflict averse. I am an accommodator, and so I didn't say, "Hey, Jenny, that's not going to work for me. Can we talk about it?" And the other, the third thing is that it only takes one person to change the game. Have mm -hmm. you noticed that? Mm -hmm. The other person doesn't have to have a lot of skill if nope. you are skilled. Yes. And, and when we talk about taking responsibility, just to clarify, we're not saying take responsibility for the whole enchilada no, no, no. and say no. it's all your fault to avoid conflict. But even the smallest step towards the middle of I may have misheard you, yes. I may have miscommunicated, uh, I would like to clarify this. Yes. alleviates us from that blame game where yes. responsibility and who's taking it becomes the tug of war. Right. Well, I also remember yes. the first time I had learned these skills and the first time I went into conflict, 
going in knowing how I was going to handle this and, and use my new skills. And I was shaking when it came up to the part where I was taking responsibility because I had never done it before. And I was literally shaking. And I remember accepting it. And and the, the person that was in conflict was like, they said, okay. And then they're looking at me like, well, because they didn't, there's no yelling. I've taken the responsibility. They're now diffused and they're looking at me like, well, what do we do now? And then I could not believe that the ball is now in my court and I laid out how I wanted to move it to a resolution. And they said, that sounds great. And I was like, that was all I needed <laughs> in that moment to, to go, I will never handle conflict in, in my, the way I handled it in the past ever again. Isn't it wonderful when something like that happens? It's a real um, it's a complete aha shift. moment, as yeah. I say, right? And it's and that's where I think conflict becomes a real opportunity for us, and that maybe will help those of us, I include myself in this, who tend to be a conflict averse, to actually not maybe look for it, but not be afraid of it when it comes to us, because there might be something we can learn here. We might be able to become more skilled. And the only way that we can become more skilled is not by reading it in a book, but by having, by actually going through the conflict and by figuring out. So one of the things I suggest to people uh, when I'm coaching them in particular is that uh, in between the times we meet, I ask them to keep a journal. I know you've talked a lot about journaling. Mm -hmm. And I say just, to, you know, it doesn't have to be a long thing if you don't like to write. You can just create like a little grid for yourself. Create in the first, uh, column what happened second column what I did third column how it turned out maybe fourth column what I would do differently next time yes um, and also exactly. what I appreciate about what I did right um, how did I do well because so often we're going oh, yeah. so quickly to what we didn't do well and it's important even if it's only hey I had the conversation I spoke up for a change that was different and so pat myself on the back next time Maybe I'll stay a little longer, or I'll talk longer, or I'll ask more questions instead of just talking, right? So uh, I think it really helps to begin to change the habits that we have. If we look, so one of the centering practices I teach people is to look back. Let's say something happens at the car mechanics, or I have a hard time with sales reps of all kind. I, they can really get my, they can really trigger me. And uh, I've gotten much better at it, I'm happy to say. <laughs> but uh, Good, because we I got something practice. to sell you. Uh, did you <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. You know me, I'll say yes. Totally okay. uh, but sometimes, uh, like, I'll hang up and I'll go, well, I didn't do that very well. Okay. So I'll go back to where I got triggered in the, like, it's like replaying the video for myself of the phone call. Uh, let's say it's a phone call. And I'll go, okay, where did I get triggered? And how could I have centered myself or how could I have taken a breath or stepped back for just a second and imagine getting to that person's side? And what would I have done differently if that had happened? See, that's a way of repatterning our, our mindset, our mental uh, way of looking at it so that the next time that happens, I'll catch myself sooner. And there's a couple things that I took away from that. One is understanding that without journaling, you don't have a frame of reference to build off of and start to grow and change things. Mm -hmm. So journaling raises that level of self-awareness. Mm. Yes. The other thing that, that you mentioned around raising that level of self-awareness, and for most of us, when we finally start to look inside, is when the conflict has become resentment or the end of a relationship. Yes. So when you get fired, when you're broken up with, are yes. typically the only times for us to look internally and say, okay, what was I bringing to the table? What was my contribution to this conflict that obviously was not resolved properly, was not managed? Yeah. But your point that every conflict is an opportunity to learn yes. how you behave, what your patterns are, what your cognitive distortions are, and what you're bringing to the table. Yeah. So it, it's, it's such an amazing flip of that viewpoint of like, it's not something I have to avoid. Yeah. These are actually growth moments for me yes. where I could be a better staff member, a better teammate, a better manager. A happier because, person. Right. If conflict mm -hmm. is happening, it typically is two-sided. Yes. It's very, very rare that conflict is only one bad apple. Yes. Yes. So we talked about listening. I believe we were covering blending and the last step of redirecting, right? Yes. So yes. We've, we've listened, we've now understood responsibility. How do we go about redirecting, redirecting to get to that resolution? Right. Well, be, as a, because of my style, as I've said, that's the 
part that took me the longest to find, you know, because there's a lot of power in Aikido. If you watch people practicing Aikido, first of all, it's very graceful, and the goal of Aikido is not to harm the opponent, but to manage yourself, to protect yourself, and also to protect your partner, and to turn this into more of like a dance-like art. Uh, so um, the power is in, as I said earlier, my changing myself so that I can get in next to the uh, attacker and then redirect them. And the power comes in, in the throw. So, uh, you know, I'm a small person. Uh, I'm five foot four, I weigh about 125 pounds. And, uh, you know, people that come at me are much bigger. They're usually, you know, big guys on the mat. And, and it doesn't matter, you know, the bigger they are, the harder they fall, seriously. And it's a lot of fun to throw them around. And it, it's, it's <laughs> Can really- Can you show Johnny after yeah, this? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> It's also, I, I will say, a lot of fun to be thrown uh, and to fly through the air. It's just great. And uh, the thing that you learn from falling, because in Aikido, falling is an art form. They call it the art of ukemi, the art of receiving. And the reason it's so great is that it's not losing. In Aikido, I fall down and get up again about 100 times a night. And what do you think that teaches me, mm -hmm. right? Resilience, that I'm not afraid to enter the conflict because I can take care of myself. I can get up again, right? Okay, so a blow comes and I go, oh, wow, I didn't expect that. All right, what am I going to do, right? I get up again and let's say, let's talk again. What happened, right? So the redirecting. So that's when I do the throw. That's when I enter and throw. <laughs> and... Uh, in, in real life, it might be, so let's, let's make up something. So, um, okay, so let's say, uh, AJ or Johnny, you come at me and you say, gee, that's a stupid idea, right? That's a really stupid idea. Now, the block and the punch back would be, no, it isn't. It's a great idea. You know, what are you talking about? You're stupid. If you can't see it, what, what's wrong with you? And even if I don't say it, I might be thinking it. Um, okay, so in Aikido, instead, I might enter right to their side, and I'll say, uh, uh, so why do you think it's stupid? What's, uh, you know, tell me what you're thinking. What specifically don't you like about it? So those are three possible questions that I could ask. Or can you tell me more? That's simple too. So people are looking like for generic questions that, that let's say they're taken off guard and somebody does attack them with a fairly a lot of energy like that. That's a stupid idea. Whoa. First of all, I gotta take a breath. I gotta think, get out of the way. Okay, well tell me more, right? Simple. What specifically didn't you like? The word specific right. is really helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then they're gonna talk for a while and you're out of the fray. You just get to listen. That's the best thing about listening if you're really doing it. You're not getting attacked anymore. They're just talking, right? And you, I actually, you know, most of this is metaphorical when I teach it in the corporate boardroom. And, uh, but there's a real physical thing you can do, which is if someone's face to face with you, you can just turn slightly and imagine all that attack energy going by. Let's say they, they're still really upset. Well, I think it's stupid because we can't afford it and I don't even know why, what you're talking about. Why are you even bringing this up at this meeting, right? So I'm just standing like mentally and maybe even physically at their side thinking, wow, they're really upset, how curious. So I become, I switch from being afraid or resistant to maybe curious or fascinated with, wow, this is a reaction I didn't expect. Now this is an internal, I call it in, inner self-defense. I'm safe, they can't hurt me, I'm fascinated. Now, the redirection comes when they're done, okay, and you're right, they have diffused now. So they've let it all out, and pretty mm -hmm. soon, sometimes people even go, wow, I'm really sorry about that, I don't know where all this energy is, because I haven't done anything, I haven't fought them. They only keep fighting if you push back. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, let's be honest, they're expecting the punch back. Yes, they that's are. right. Because they want to throw their, their second combination. So when you actually don't punch back at all, yes. they get a little out over their skis, and now they have to explain why <laughs> they were so aggressive. And whenever you come at someone that strongly, like you're an idiot or you're stupid, well, you're going to start to feel some shame as you're explaining and realizing that there's no need to personalize it. Yeah, and I'm standing there smiling, right? And wow, that's funny. You know, and they're like, oh, wait, okay, something's not happening. You're right. They're out of their skis. They've lost their balance, right? Mm -hmm. And so in Aikido, seriously, my goal as the person who's receiving the attack is to actually help them find their balance again because the attack, they'll, they'll lose their balance because I'm not pushing back. So the redirection comes when I say something like, wow, you think we can't afford it? What if we could afford it? Or what can we do? 
to possibly afford it? Do we need to raise some money? Right. So now I'm looking for solutions, right? I'm focused on a solution. And that's when we turn from an adversary into a partner. The way they talk about in uh, getting to yes, getting past no. I know some of the books you've talked about already on mm -hmm. some of your podcasts. Uh, they're wonderful books. And, and it's all about changing your adversary into a partner for problem solving. And it only takes me, the skilled one, to do it. They don't have to know. I just have to keep asking, well, how are we going to do it? So I'm redirecting them now toward uh, looking at a possible solution. You think we can't afford it? Tell me more about that. So I might ask some more questions. I might not go right to a solution because I want them to feel fully heard. And I also, if I'm really solution-oriented, I want to know everything that might stop this. Mm -hmm. If I really want to do the project, let's right. say. Their, their viewpoint is, is still helpful in the solution here. And I, I, I can't stress that enough because even we, we know we're right, we have a resolution, we've already made the decision internally, we are still operating with blind spots and yes. talking it through with a teammate. There's a reason we have collaborative meetings. Companies are not run by just one person making all the decisions That's because right. they're going to bring that other perspective that could help solidify that solution get their buy-in, as you say. Yes. And I, I love the, the idea of getting to what we call neutral body language, shoulder to shoulder, side yes. by side. The problem is out in front of you. We're not adversarial. It actually changes your physiology. Mm -hmm. You're yes. not getting that stress response of being in each other's faces. And imagine if now the focus is on the resolution and you're asking questions that lead them to focusing on the solution. Wow feels totally different and diffused from that situation of, well, no, you're wrong, and no, let me show you how I'm right. That's right. We've stopped focusing on each other. You're not the problem anymore. We've, one person, you know, has rearranged things, both physically sometimes, mm -hmm. as you're saying, Johnny uh, and AJ, and also we have shifted our attention from each other to solving the problem. So here's the problem, what are we gonna do about it? It's not you, it's not your idea that's bad, it's like here's the problem that we wanna solve. So I just keep redirecting towards that. And I've, I've used this now in, in 13 years of managing the company, we've had countless arguments yeah. on, on the team, countless conflict, it happens even when you, you love each other and, and your friends, and it the tone and the feel is just so different even if in that situation where you have a presentation or something in front of you you swing around to their side and show them the computer screen and now we're both looking at the computer screen and show me how i'm wrong show me how there's another option here and that diversion of attention the deflection of all that stress and physiological response really works wonders and we've had clients after the program use it uh, we've used it in resolutions, mediations, mm -hmm. move to the same side of the table so that we're not sitting across from each other. Our physicians who come through the program, we say, swing your stool over to the patient, put the yes. chart in front of you so you're both looking at the chart. Here's the results, let's work on this together. Yes. And reinforcing that team mentality diffuses it and we can get to the resolution. Yes. Now, this is great when we, of course, are in conflict with someone, but we also know as we grow in our career that we are going to have to manage conflict amongst two people, yep. maybe even two children in yep. our household. <laughs> yep. And I think that adds another layer that a lot of people, especially those of us who are conflict averse, struggle with. What are the different strategies from when we're actually in conflict with someone or now we're trying to manage conflict between two people? What's the nuance there? Okay. So if I'm the manager and I've got two people who are upset with each other and I need them both, okay, they're both valuable to the company, I don't want to fire them, I, and yet they're causing, you know, difficulty. Their team is not productive because everybody's staying away from them. You know, when two people are in conflict, they're not just stressing each other out, they're stressing mm -hmm. the entire environment out. What you do is basically the same skills, okay, it's that, but you're doing it now as a coach. You, f you shift from being a manager to a coach, if you're willing to do it. And uh, in the book I talk, that, that that's what the book's really about, this model of how a manager can work with, their, with two employees like this. And what I suggest is not to get them in a room together right away because that's, that's probably because we're thinking I don't have time, I gotta get this over with, this is causing problems, let's get them in a room and just talk it out. Usually what happens, if, especially if the conflict has been going on for a while, there's a lot of pent up emotion and the emotion just escalates and everybody just wants to you know, fight each other and you're sitting there watching things just get worse. What I recommend is that the manager 
uh, work with each person separately at first uh, for several sessions if necess necessary. They can just be an hour each. Uh, and you play the role of listening to the person that, uh, that they need. You know, the, the person that they're in conflict with can't listen right now. Mm -mm. If they could, they would have already. And they can't, and so you they this uh, each each party party A and party B, each one needs to be heard and needs to defuse what's going on. They have a story that has brought them into this conflict. Mm -hmm. You, as the manager coach, can uh, sit with each person and listen to their story to the point where now they feel heard. And what's important, as you're the manager, the skills you bring to this are uh, are several. Uh, I'll mention some of the biggies, okay? One is uh, that I have to, as, as the manager, coach, it really helps if I have an attitude that something good can come out of this. That not only can this conflict be resolved, but with some skill, these two really important employees can gain some social and, social and emotional skills and intelligence and become perhaps leaders for the rest of their team. Because if they get good at this, they'll start to spread it around. So I have to believe that some good can come out of this. And that there's an opportunity here on lots of levels. Another really important skill that I bring is non-judgment. It helps, it's almost a necessity that I walk into this conflict not having a belief that one or the other, party A or party B, is right and needs to win. I can't be on one or the other party's mm -hmm. side. Because the non-judgment is, uh, is what allows the person to tell their story and to feel heard. And then I, I acknowledge, uh, I help the people reframe conflict from this is some, you're not a bad person, you just need skills. I'll never forget the time I was doing this, uh, someone brought me in from the outside and I was doing it with two employees in a big insurance company. And when it was over and they were getting along well and they were able to talk to each other, and uh, get along really well in the workplace. I remember our last session, one of the parties said, you know, I, I had no idea that this was just a set of skills I could learn. <laughs> that I'm not a bad person because yeah. I had conflict. And she was so serious that this is just a set of skills. Anybody can learn this. I said, yeah. yeah. So non-judgment, reframing, seeing conflict as an opportunity, seeing uh, the positive the possibilities here that are inherent, and and just listening, asking useful, open questions. So then you work with each party, and pretty soon they're starting to feel more centered and more calm because they have told you and they feel heard. And yeah. and and not only that, but you're actually aligning with each party, right? I know it sounds weird, and you tell them. You know, when I'm doing it, I say, you know, I'm I see your side. I'm on your side. And I'm also on their side because I see both sides. Mm -hmm. And then pretty soon they go, oh, she sees their side. Maybe I could see their side, right? Right. So, right? so empathy starts to get built, and they haven't even talked to each other yet. So that when you do finally bring the parties together, there's a chance that they can now talk about the stuff. And, and plus you have a greater understanding as the manager. Yeah, and I think the important component of that listening is the validating of their emotions that yes. go along with this. Because in conflict, there's always going to be the facts, the details, and then there's the emotions mm -hmm. tied to it. And unfortunately, some of the emotions might have nothing to do with this conflict. It could have to do with the conflict at home, or as I said, the traffic on the way to work. But if those emotions are not diffused, yeah. then we can't actually get to a resolution. So validating the emotions, I could see how that's frustrating. I understand it's difficult when there's a lack of communication. Those simple statements right there allow the other person to feel heard emotionally yes. so that they don't come in supercharged emotional when you do bring both parties together yes well emotions are such a, a difficult thing a lot of times we don't understand why we feel it in a certain way but we feel it or it's it's skewing how we're viewing what's going on and 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 those emotions can be tied as you mentioned to, to the traffic or, or now, what yeah. happens when you get them in the room together, you've tried as best you can, and you realize that the conflict that we're discussing here is actually not the conflict. This has been going on for a while. There's clear resentment built, and this is just one of a string of conflicts that haven't been resolved. Right. Uh, great question. And ideally, I mean, 
if you've done your job, you know this before you get them in the room. Right. Because you've asked enough questions as you realize that this is just one in a string and this goes way back. And so you decide uh, how to bring them together knowing that. Uh, one piece I, I have left out that's important is that you're not only listening to their stories in these sessions, you're actually helping them learn skills. Mm -hmm. You're teaching them skills. Skills like listening, skills like curiosity, like being interested in, uh, and, you're, and you're role playing with them like you do in your boot camps. You're role playing. And you're bringing up examples of things that have caused them conflict in the workplace. And you say, now what would you say if this happened? And you go back and forth and, until they feel comfortable or not. And then you learn why they're not and why they won't do it. Uh, you might do some personality style indicators to find out maybe there's a style clash that's going on that they can talk about when they get together. One of them is an accommodator, the other one isn't. And so they're, yeah. they're just clashing styles and, and that might help them to work through it. Uh, but if the emotions get high, right? So in, also in the set of skills, you're teaching them how to, uh, like we just said, AJ, search for solutions. So you're redirecting. You're, you're sitting back at this point as much as you can and beginning to ask them questions about how they can now start to talk together. And in the book, there's a list of questions that, that will help the person, the manager. Uh, if emotions get high, you, just, you, you ask them to, let's take a time out, right? And we take a break. And uh, you begin to ask questions about what just happened here. So it's not about what's happening, it's the awareness around what's happening. And Johnny, when you mentioned emotions, it's also not just the emotion, right? It's my attitude toward the emotion. Mm -hmm. If I think I'm a bad person because I just got angry, that's, that's not gonna help, right? <laughs> if, <laughs> if, 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 if I'm able to say to myself, wow, I'm really angry right now, how, I wonder what's going on. Um, maybe I need to talk about it with somebody. That's a really different response to my anger. So I, in a sense, you play Aikido with yourself right you blend with your own emotions it's like you're getting attacked from the inside and you go wow i wonder why i'm upset what's going on i need to take a look at this this is this from what happened to me when i was five or is this something that's happening now uh and so the manager can do that too the manager can say let's take a step back let's just do a time out let's go drink a water or something and find out what's going on here and maybe separate them and work separately again if that right happens. so reset things there reset. now are there some markers as a manager that can allow us to see conflict under the surface because we do know in these situations especially as managers who are overseeing a lot of teammates and processes that um, you know typically by the time the conflict really gets to us it can be a big problem so are there ways that we can see some signs or signals to nip it in the bud ahead of time and know when to step in to resolve something yes I think there are and I think they have to do with uh, you know, concrete facts like projects not getting done on time. And you can't figure out the reason for it. It may be because two people have, ref you know, can't communicate anymore. Like they're not talking to each mm -hmm. other and they're doing workarounds. And so things aren't getting done. Okay. So if projects aren't getting done on time, if people are um, saying, uh, coming to you instead of talking to each other, if you're finding that you're having too many conversations with someone and saying, well, why don't you just talk to uh, Jenny about it? And they're, I can't talk to Jenny. Suddenly, you know, now there's a problem, right? right? Uh, so th it can be really concrete things, just like that. Right. So performance indicators, performance indicators. Com side conversations, yes. Uh, yes, and and probably the energy and the, the group meetings together, noticing exactly. how people communicate and interact with each other, and do they change their personality around someone? Like you've noticed them as typically happy, but when so and so sits in the room next to them, like Johnny. They get all stern and frustrated. <laughs> yes, yes, that's a really good indicator. And or if someone's not speaking at meetings, if mm -hmm. if suddenly you know someone who's usually fairly talkative is not saying a word, um, you know, I'd be curious about that. And if someone is new to a leadership position and they're sensing these signals, is there situations where they are clear to resolve the conflict or work on it, and, and others where they are not, or do you? feel that being proactive in all situations is helpful when you notice these signals? Well, great. I'm glad you asked. That's a great question. Because stepping up, I yeah. feel like, is is always a, a concern or frustration yes. of like, but am I going to step on someone's toes? Is this something that you know my, I should bring to my manager instead? Uh, if you're the manager and you're trying to decide, should I step in? That's what you're asking. 
Right. right. Well, of course, yeah. you, you know, unless you're running the company, there's always going to be a layer of management yeah. ahead, above you. And for a lot of our audience who are now starting their career in management, yes. you know, they can be feeling that, but they're like, well, maybe I don't have the tools yet. I listen to this podcast. I haven't had training. Um, what is the line for them to step in and, and be assertive and the line to go up a level in management? A lot of the line has to do with purpose. And in one of the words I use probably the most, if you did one of those word clouds in the book, is purpose. What is my purpose here? If I'm just trying to get this done and solve it and get it over with, it's probably not, I, sh I probably shouldn't. I couldn't, I shouldn't enter. I shouldn't be assertive with this because uh, I don't have, uh, I don't have the, the right attitude for it. If I basically like both people and I can't, I think they're both excellent workers and they're both pretty good people by themselves and they've just gotten into some uh, toxic relationship or not even toxic, just d into some sort of a tangle, right? Um, then, and I think I might be able to help them by separating them and just talking to each one and listening to their story and I think I can be non-judgmental and I think I can help them see that by resolving this conflict, uh, they would be happier people and happier workers and maybe even leaders in the company. If I think I can do that, at least I could start, right? And if I get to the point where I don't have the skills, then I'll stop and I'll get the skills. Or I'll talk to someone like you or my own coach. You know, I'll get my own coach and start working with it, my own coach. But if I have, a, if I have a, a feeling that I'd like to try this and I have a good attitude toward it and I, I think I might be able to help, why not? Right. Right. So being proactive. Yeah, you don't have to be perfect at this. <laughs> being proactive is okay unless you're just trying to get it done or you have a <coughs> feeling like some of the um, some of the, the ideas or attitudes that are not conducive to helping people are if I have the attitude that why are they being so hurtful toward each other or why don't they just get over it or what's wrong with these people? <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> these are not helpful attitudes. Right, so yeah. negative judgments negative about the participants. Judgments. Yeah. I would also assume trying to impress people, so yes. doing it for, for personal gain yes. instead of actually the purpose being to resolve the conflict. Yes. Now, outside of getting a job in a bar or <laughs> looking for your own conflict and lighting things on fire like Johnny over here, uh, do you have any tips for our audience to practice these skills as they go about their daily lives? Uh, you've talked about them so much already, and I know you do this a lot in your boot camp, but uh, you know, if, in Aikido we talk about centering and um, practicing centering in a, in a fairly consistent way, in different ways, that that's always the foundation, and that's how I manage me so that I can manage whatever comes at me. So that's the first place I would start. Build, start building a foundation of centering, and I'll give some examples here. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my other teachers, Wendy Palmer, who's written a lot of books and is also an Aikidoist, uh, talks about three different kinds of practice. One is a committed practice. So I meditate every day, or I pray every day, or I uh, practice Aikido, or I do yoga, or I do something for the purpose of recentering myself at the beginning of the day and maybe at the end of the day. That's a committed practice. Mm -hmm. And so when things come up during the day, Right? I'm more likely to be able to get back to center because I have this nice foundation that I've built. Quiet sitting, I call it. It could just be quiet sitting. Uh, a ritual practice, that's the second category. A ritual is I put my seatbelt on and I center myself before I s pull out of the driveway, all right? Great idea. I come to a red light. I find myself, oh my God, why is that light red? or I'm in stuck in rush, rush hour traffic. That could be a ritual for centering. Hey, I can't do anything about it. I can only change me. So I'm just gonna sit here and breathe and wait till the light changes or wait till the traffic starts to move. These are, my car is my like practice laboratory. <laughs> I'll tell you, you know, I'm always like triggered by people tailgating me or driving too slow or not giving their cert, turn signal. These are great pr opportunities to create rituals. But don't move to LA then. Oh, don't what? <laughs> don't move to L.A. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, I know. No, <laughs> I live in a small town in New Hampshire. No worries there. Okay. Um, but uh, another ritual I have is when the phone, my phone, you know, does its sound, whatever it might be, rings, let's say. Uh, instead of picking it right up, I just, you know, or the text thing comes. Instead of mm -hmm. going right to it, right, I just center myself first. And then I look to see who it is. 
big difference, right? Because there are people who will text you or, you know, ring you or email you that you don't even want to ever hear from again sometimes, right? And so if you're centered when you go to that email, whatever, you're more likely to go, wow, okay, now what am I going to do? And more likely to have a measured response. So these are rituals you can create for yourself. If you, I know you talked too about separating, uh, you know, having boundaries around work and home. Uh, a nice ritual is when um, I get home after, you know, like I, I've just been on the road for two days. When I, when I touch that doorknob walking into my house, I just think, breathe, center, smile. <sighs> That's all it takes. It takes less than a second. And I walk in the door, I'm a different person. Same thing with going to work, you know? Mm -hmm. Whatever. I like that. See, Johnny, when I'm not responding to your text, I'm centering myself. <laughs> You're centering yourself. Now you know. Well, it's it's just so easy to get consumed with so many different things. I, I know personally that I, for <clears throat> my meals that I have throughout the day or any some other things that I may be doing, I make sure that I stop everything else. Like, do I really need to be on Facebook as I'm having lunch? Like, can I, like, that, and be, just because it's easy doesn't yes. mean I should be doing it. Yes. And 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 I, I want to taste my food. I want to enjoy this moment. And so I've been trying to make it those habits of if I'm going to eat, I'm going to sit here and and that's and maybe I'll put some music on, but that's that's it. I don't need to be distracted with a million other things. Go to Facebook, check email. No, have your lunch. Enjoy it. Here here. I, multitasking is way overrated. What's really hard is doing one at thing at a time. <laughs> and we're terrible, we're terrible at it. it. And it, it's, it's a myth anyway. But, uh, so, okay, so my, a couple of other suggestions. When in doubt, ask a question. You know, if you're stuck, if you feel uncentered, if you're like a deer in headlights and something just came at you, breathe, center, and ask a question that you don't know the answer to. And see what happens. And then just sit there and continue to center while the other person talks. Um, and know that you have more power than you think in conflict. You really do. And it's not the power to control the other person. It's the mm -hmm. power over you. You have ultimate total control here in your mind, body, and spirit. And when you know that, and you will forget it. I forget it all the time. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> Amy's listening, and she's like, wait a second. AJ <laughs> teaches conflict. I'm not seeing these I know, I know. <laughs> centering practices. So true. When you catch yourself, you should go, wow, thank you very much to yourself. Thank you so much for letting me catch that, that moment when I almost lost it. So uh, uh, center yourself, breathe, ask a question, know that you have more power than you think, and that when you change, everything changes. When you change, like you said, uh, I, and I think we were, this was before we got on tape, but, you know, if I walk into this room with you guys and I'm in kind of a limp place or my, I have a frowny face or whatever, we're going to have a very different interview than if I walk in going, hey, how's it going, guys? You know, um, same thing. If I walk into a conversation that I think might be difficult and I'm thinking to myself, oh, this is going to be so hard. I can't believe it. I don't even believe that I'm going to do this. I know nothing's good is going to happen here. I... I Nothing good's gonna happen. I'll tell you that yeah. right off. But if I walk in going, well, it, it could be a challenge, but I'm excited because I know I'm gonna learn something no matter what happens. Even if I get a fool of myself, I'm gonna learn something, right? Then you're gonna learn something. And what could be better than that? Thank you so much for joining us. Wonderful <laughs> tips. I'm definitely gonna be centering myself after this interview. <laughs> I think Working. everyone needs to learn how to center themselves. Especially in LA traffic. <laughs> And where can our listeners find your fantastic book and more oh, about what you do? Thank you. Thank you very much. It, 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 I love the book. I started reading it again myself the other day, and I was like, hey, oh, this is pretty good. Yeah, you know, that's how you know it's, it's a good kind book. Of fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's true, right? Um, it's called Turn Enemies into Allies, The Art of Peace in the Workplace, and you can find it on Amazon or wherever books are sold. My website is probably uh, a wonderful resource, I hope, because I created what I hope is a teaching website that people can get on there and download stuff and read my blog, which I've been writing for uh, decades. And uh, there's just, you can search it. Uh, there's an article on there called The Checklist for Difficult Conversations that people find all the time and say is really useful. So it's judyringer.com, J-U-D-Y-R-I-N-G-E-R.com. Thank you so much for coming in studio. It was a pleasure. Total pleasure. Thank you. But I feel alive